It's our birthday. Perfect for Throwback Thursday. That's what we looked like when we first launched 25 years ago under the name CNN Newsroom. It's not all that's changed. We'll have more on our history about nine minutes in the future. I'm Carl Azus. Today's CNN student news coverage starts in Iraq. We've talked about how a terrorist group named ISIS, or Islamic State, has violently taken over parts of Iraq, hoping to establish a government based on ISIS's severe interpretation of Islam. Less than three years after the last U.S. combat troops left Iraq, the U.S. government is deploying about 130 Marines and Special Operations Forces there. They'll be working as advisors, joining hundreds of other Americans already in Iraq to advise Iraqi troops. And some experts are warning about something called mission creep, when a military operation unintentionally gets bigger than its initial mission. Here, the aftermath of a devastating U.S. airstrike on ISIS fighters in northern Iraq. The Obama administration insists attacks from the air like this one are the limit of America's combat role in Iraq. But several veteran Iraq commanders we interviewed say mission creep is inevitable. I think this is the first toe in the water, and eventually uh, this administration will have to confront how to destroy this Islamic State. When you look at the capabilities, or rather the lack of capabilities of the Iraqi military, uh, that the U.S. is going to have to be more involved uh, going forward. Do you think that that's a reasonable uh, assessment? You need a organization, whether it's the United States or coalition forces, to come in and provide them with uh, professional military advice. And eventually, if uh, U.S. forces are not on the ground, uh, I don't see how we're going to keep ISIS at bay. For now, the administration has defined U.S. objectives very narrowly. One, protect tens of thousands of members of Iraq's Yazidi minority from an impending massacre. And two, protect hundreds of American diplomats and military advisors stationed in Erbil and Baghdad. However, even the Pentagon concedes those goals, as strictly defined, do not address ISIS itself. These strikes are unlikely to affect ISIL's overall capabilities or its operations in other areas of Iraq and Syria. In fact, since the president first announced U.S. military action last Thursday, the U.S. has already expanded its military support, sending weaponry to Kurdish forces and now increasing the number of U.S. military advisors on the ground. Today, Secretary of State John Kerry categorically ruled out U.S. ground troops, though, crucially, he set the stage for further military support for Iraq's new government. The U.S. does stand ready to fully support a new and inclusive Iraqi government, particularly uh, in its fight against ISIL. Time for the shout out. What celestial object is believed to be created by a collapsed star? You know how this works. If you think you know it, shout it out. Is it an accretion, black hole, corona, or dwarf star? You've got three seconds. Go. Scientists believe that when a star collapses, a black hole is created. That's your answer, and that's your shout-out. Scientists can't see a black hole with a telescope, and for that reason, there are a lot of theories, sometimes contradicting ones, about what exactly black holes are. NASA has a telescope in orbit that's been hunting for black holes. It's called New Star, and what it does is collect X-rays from a suspected black hole that's about 324 million light-years from Earth. Yes, that's a long way. This is an artist's rendering of what New Star detected. Scientists believe the areas around supermassive black holes shine brightly in X-rays. So NASA's saying that as this particular black hole draws in the light around it, scientists are able to observe that light through the X-rays collected by New Star. They're hoping this helps them better understand and solve the mysteries surrounding black holes. Every day we pick three schools that are watching for our roll call. We get them from each day's transcript page, so please feel free to make a new request daily until we call you. Today we're hailing the hurricanes of West Harrison High School. Great to see y'all in Gulfport, Mississippi. Rosemary Clark Middle School, we've got the Sharks. Thank you for watching in Pahrump, Nevada. And across the Pacific, 
Hello to the students of Hankook University of Foreign Studies. They're watching in Yongin City, South Korea. If an old woman could live in a shoe, then a parking space sounds far more spacious. But when we're talking about a home that's only about 130 square feet, smaller than a dorm room at college, it's not for people seeking ample closet space or a garden tub. Savannah College of Art and Design came up with an idea that's a tight but sustainable fit. You have 78 million millennials. Over 80% of them want to live in center cities. They don't mind living in smaller spaces because they really see their home as just a part of their lifestyle. The city is where they live. We're returning to urban areas at an unprecedented rate, and we're re-examining how we're using space in our cities. We spent the 20th century leaving our cities, and in fact, in many cases, building parking structures where once buildings stood. So what we inherit today as we head into the 21st century is a lot of structures in our center cities that are overbuilt many times in the best locations. At the same time, we have these assets in place. And the question is, what do we do with that? So SCADPAD seeks to ask a question about how we might reinvent, how we might model an immediate strategy for sustainable adaptive reuse. The greenest building is the one that's already built. So in the case of our prototype community, we gave each unit one private space for the SCAD pad, one courtyard that was adjacent. So every unit had two parking spaces. Each unit is eight feet by 16 feet, so 135 square feet. They're sized to fit into a standard parking space. Each SCAD pad is built on a mobile platform so that it can be repositioned anywhere within a parking structure or can be relocated to any other structure virtually worldwide. This micro home incorporates all the things that you need for a full lifestyle. So there's a sleeping area, a food preparation area, there's a small bathroom with all the services, and there's open space for multiple scenarios, whether it be dining, whether it be working, uh, setting up a desk. The on-site 3D printer allows residents to immediately customize the unit around their individual tastes and needs. That hook that you might want in the kitchen for a particular utensil can just be printed on site and brought back into your space, positioned anywhere you want. So every inch of the space was thought of. And that became the departure for the art and the technology that would then become the next phase of the design process. Each SCAD pad has a smart glass film applied to all of its windows. So if you want privacy, you can just dim the windows. And then when you're ready to look out, the window's open. So at the touch of a button, you can move from a private space to an open space, expanding your sense of envelope outside of the unit, out to the city skyline, beyond. All of that happens, again, at the level of the skin of the building. An entirely new possibility for a new generation of dwellers. All right, so we look a little different now than when CNN first launched a commercial-free news program for classrooms. Welcome to CNN Newsroom. I'm Brian Todd. And I'm Cassandra Henderson. Here are some of the stories we have coming up. Anchors were still awesome, graphics were still awesome, and our mission was the same, to bring award-winning current events coverage to a student audience. It's because of you and especially your teachers that we're celebrating our 25th birthday today, so thank you for being the most important part of CNN Student News. Of course, the puns came a little later, what some of you would call the punishment and others call punny punchlines. There's certainly a pun usual tradition for a news show. Going without them today would be pun thinkable, mainly because they're pun stoppable. It helps to be pun flappable because saying them on air is often pun funny. I'm Carl Azus. Hope to see you tomorrow.